All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. There's a few people still trickling in, but um, uh, this session is uh, titled, oops, Cons I believe, Consolidate Without Compromise and Security. Um, uh, our, uh, uh, three of our speakers today, the first one, Carmen Iannacone, uh, seating at the left as the Chief Technology Officer for the Smithsonian Institute. He is responsible for evaluating and implementing new technologies for use in the Smithsonian IT infrastructure and for optimizing performance in its IT operations. The institution's 19 museums and research stations provide a diverse technology climate and his role is an integral liaison between centralized IT and the public. Uh, Richard Boat, to his right, is the manager of Infrastructure Services Delivery Group at the Air Traffic Organization within FAA. With a background in physics and IT, having worked in both the government and private sectors, Richard Bowe currently manages the Infrastructure Services Delivery Group within FAA's ATO-IT office. The FAA ATO National Service Center, under Bowe's direction, was recently awarded certification by the Help Desk Institute, only one of 24 such certifications in the world. I didn't know that. That's great. Uh, his current initiative to establish the, and operate a best-in-class data center operation leveraging cloud technology is nearing fruition. And unfortunately, um, the third speaker couldn't make it, so we need to thank Peter Mel for stepping in at the last minute. And uh, Peter is the senior computer scientist at uh, NIST. And with that, I'll hand it off to Peter to kick it off. Okay. Good. Thank you, Param. Uh, it is a pleasure to talk to you. Let me turn this out. There we go. Pleasure to be here. Uh, we are excited. Is that better? Yeah. please. Excellent. Okay, good. The height was wrong in that one. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I get the wonderful role of replacing Joe Albal, uh, our Albo from uh, FAA, which means that I get to moderate and be the inquisitor. Uh, these gentlemen have great stories of data center consolidation uh, that relate to cloud. So we're going to kind of move from data center consolidation stories to cloud computing. We're going to investigate uh, security implications uh, therein, so ask tough questions, hard questions. Uh, Richard said, don't hold any punches back. At least he said that to me. I assume that applies to you, too. Um, so with that, uh, Richard, why don't you start and tell, okay. us about, tell us about your story. All right. Um, I, am, I run the infrastructure for the uh, non-NASA, non-airspace uh, air traffic control system. It's about 80 percent of the FAA, 35,000 desktops at about 1,000 different locations. Um, and as you know, ATO's role is, is to put as much tin in the air and keep it separated. Uh, you know, safety and efficiency of the airspace is our, is our primary function that I support. The other part of the FAA is the regulation certification. I like to look at them as a brake pedal. We're the gas, we're trying to, and they're, they're standing on the brake. So that's, uh, that's the FAA in a nutshell. Um, the, uh, the situation that, that I inherited uh, in the air traffic organization was basically every facility owner was their own little king or queen and they built their own network and they provided their own support and it was just the way it had to be done originally. Um, in uh, FY 2006 we uh, were able to convince management to let us go ahead and consolidate the 20 call centers into a single call center to standardize the network for multiple different network operating systems into Active Directory and to um, uh, get on a program of standardizing the desktops. What had happened in the, in the past is that every time a new PC showed up, the manager got it, and the older equipment trickled down the chain until you know, we had 15-year-old PCs out there. So um, what, where we are now, uh, we started that in 2006, and I think at the end of 2008, we, uh, put, we finished the rollout for the standardized call center. Um, the, and then just uh, a couple years later now, we have the HDI cert, which I'm, I'm real proud of the staff for being able to pull that off. Uh, the network is standardized on Active Directory, uh, managed centrally. Um, we've deployed network access control at all thousand sites, so nobody can put in a, a plug in a PC uh, in any of our network that, that I manage. Um, that, that was a huge security uh, uh, 
opportunity for us. Uh, it also enabled us to, to uh, do some of the uh, uh, the NAC solution we have is when you turn on, fire up a certain type of application, the system will, will turn it off before it turns on. So it, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, the standardized computing environment, we have the, I, I remember it was uh, Dr. The guy who did the lead off yesterday, talk, yeah, talking about a single CPU. Uh, that policy was up from the get go. Um, we have, uh, we've rolled out uh, managed print output where we're pulling back uh, uh, the, the number of PC, uh, computers, and I'm sorry, printers that we have now is about 15,000 nationally. Um, we think we can whittle that down to maybe six, 7,000 because some of the smaller sites uh, weren't, are not going to get the benefit of, of harmonizing uh, the print infrastructure. So we've been uh, leading that pretty well within the government um, uh, on, on managed print output, seeing some significant savings. One of the, the main reasons why I'm, I took it on is that when they gave me my organization, they gave me the option, do you want to control the toner as well as the printers? And I figured they're only going to ask that question one time. <laughs> so I said, give me the money. Um, so we spend three and a half million dollars a year on toner. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping to cut that in half with the management output thing. Um, and then uh, the other part of the data, of the consolidation was data centers. We've got two tier two data centers, two tier one slash two, basically the corner of an office building data centers. Uh, we're space and cooling and power constrained uh, desperately. Uh, so when the command center, the air traffic command center uh, recently moved from Herndon to Warrington, the old uh, EDS, now HP building, which was a tier three data center originally, became available and I was able to run that through the investment analysis and, and uh, we now have a tier three data center at Herndon, 31,000 square feet of production space. Uh, that the FAA will eventually consume, but right now it's available. So any of you guys that need colo space, uh, we've got space. Um, and I'm looking to help uh, uh, offset the cost to all of us by, by sharing resources and, uh, and uh, just making it better. And, that, and so that's one of the things that we'll talk about here in a, in a bit, minute. Um, I, I guess I, what I will go into now, some of the challenges as, as a kind of an entrepreneurial kind of guy um, in the government, I've got this space, um, I can't make any money, um, but what I can do is the more people I get participating in it, the lower my unit cost gets and the lower your unit cost gets. So I've been uh, talking to several different uh, agencies uh, in the D.C. area, mostly the small ones, the big guys, you know, the DISAs and DODs and IRS, they don't need any help from this stuff. But uh, the smaller organizations um, are, are out of space and interested in, in co-location uh, initially. The challenge that I'm going to report to you, and I'd like to get some feedback from you as, as we go through the discussion, is um, many of these agencies haven't even started virtualizing yet. Uh, there's hundreds of racks of equipment in office buildings with no generator backup, no, you know, just virtually they're just there. And uh, remote management is still a concept for them. Um, they, they still like to hug the warm iron. Um, so we have some cultural challenges there on even getting something as simple as finding a tier three space to put servers. Um, then another uh, issue that we're seeing is, is a control, again, mostly in colo. Um, they, you know, the, the next thing out of their mouth is that they want to move their entire data center sta staff out to where the stuff is coloed, and it's like, no, 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 it ain't happening. Um, that you, as part of the colo thing, I think this is standard with Terramark too, we'll, we'll do 10 resets per rack per month as part of the cost and then five more detailed troubleshoots per month per rack just to try and get them at ease that no, this isn't going to be a new office building with servers, it's a data center. Um, so we, we, there's the, the process around them, uh, the comfort, the trust level to be built up in, 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 and I think where I'm going is with data centers and co-location and cloud, I think the primary issue is trust. That can you, can you guys trust my operation to be mature enough to not go in and recycle one of your servers without having a ticket? And, and how can you prove that to me? And, and, and then the classified, uh, the security of uh, background checks of the staff. I mean, I, I don't think my uh, 
back, I mean, this is all unclassified. So I don't think my background uh, checks for my contract are any different than his, but you know, is there a common background check that's used in government to allow use to official use um, systems? And then uh, with the cloud uh, part I'm seeing, again, this is relating stories that I'm from other agencies, is the, uh, within the cloud, there's a lot of concern around the, the virtual, uh, the reliability of the virtual network uh, the virtual server environment and the ability of my staff to manage that in a way that isn't going to not only bring down the FAA but bring down every other government agency that's in there as well. So um, it's, it's around uh, operational processes, change management processes, stuff like that seems to be a tripping point. Again, I'd love to get some feedback from you guys as to why you would or would not consider uh, using a government provider as uh, as a, as a cloud, a basic building a community cloud. Uh, so I'd like to hear what your, what your concerns are. Um, and I, 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 get, I know that my costs are way lower than the commercial sector because I got a really low rent and I can't make a profit and I can't cover for risk. So anyhow, that's my story. Turn it over to Carmen. To it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, I, I saw on the attendees list that some folks are actually from outside the states, so I wanted to, to talk a little bit about what the Smithsonian Institution is and does in case you, you haven't heard of it. Um, it's a, a federation of 19 museums and research stations here in the states. They're largely centered around the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Um, they are uh, partially federal. They are, we are not a... Uh, uh, departmental agency like some of the groups that, that you may have been exposed to today um, that's for good and for bad or that it cuts both ways I should say um, and uh, we um, we don't have how much was it uh, 35 million three, 35,000 and how much in toner oh three and a half million three and a half a million in toner we don't use three and a half million in toner but you'd be surprised how much a panda can eat <laughs> it's real. It's amazing. So we have the National Zoo. We have the Air and Space Museums. Uh, we have the uh, uh, National Museum of Natural History. Um, I'm sure you, you you may have heard of them. So I won't belabor the issue. Um, having said all that, we have a very heterogeneous uh, mandate. And un again, unlike some of the organizations um, th that will speak here, our mission is very open. Uh, so we're our mission is the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And so our goal is to get more people onto our networks, to get our information outside. Really, uh, everyone is welcome to visit the Smithsonian in its electronic or physical forms, and I'd encourage you to do it. Um, so when you undertake an, an, an activity like consolidation that actually comes to bear in, in how people are currently executing the mission and whether they believe that uh, your ideas of better serving and more cost-effectively serving the mission through consolidation will be met. Um, that's kind of a backdrop behind the standard IT spectrum that a consolidation presents. So we consolidate for cost savings and lower complexity and, and, and centralization of our gear to better standardize it, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, when you have uh, folks that have been providing that service uh, in a disparate environment, say, um, they, they look with a jaundiced eye to your ability to do it, and it does come down to trust. That's a very, very good point. Um, at Smithsonian, we have uh, this spectrum where first we moved our gear. There will always be at any museum or research station very unique gear that needs to stay close to the um, point of sale, if that's the right way to say it. Um, you know, so there's, in a museum, there's a lot of video going on, a very rich media experience. You need a media presence at that facility at, at, at current speeds and feeds in order to deliver what's expected from the visitor or expected by the visitor. Um, but that having been said, much of the uh, collection information systems or donor management systems, the traditional ERP capabilities can all be centralized. And so um, a few years ago, uh, we undertook that step to begin co-locating to a Herndon-based data center. Um, and we have uh, achieved that step. Um, there's um, always going to be, as we work with our scientists and researchers, uh, a question as to whether something is best kept 
back at HQ or something is best kept out, out in the field. Um, and uh, after you get this gear under management, then the, I think the next logical step is how might you virtualize it. So we've uh, been virtualizing for some time now. Uh, virtualization presents its own collection of, uh, uh, of challenges as you think about who can be co-tenant on the same virtualized server, even though it's abstracted to look as much as possible like a dedicated piece of hardware. Um, there are still some considerations. Um, and, and one uh, tip that immediately comes to mind, and it won't surprise you, a lot of these conferences are where birds of a feather get together and we remind ourselves of these fundamental things, but uh, your documentation <laughs> is, reminds you how important it is when you uh, seek to move a system from one place to another or realize it in a virtual framework. If you don't have up-to-date uh, MOUs, if you don't have up-to-date documentation, if your trading partners uh, relied on intermediary hardware to be configured a certain way or to react to certain things, that's very important. And then for what our our business folks or what our users do to themselves in the past few years, they've been engaging in software as a service, uh, SOA implementations, and so if their documentation is uh, out of sync as to how hardware and software components interrelate, that will come visit you as you, as you engage in this process. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more back and forth, I'm sure, about the challenges that are similar, but uh, many of the things that you said resonated. I'll come up for air, Peter, and, and let you drive. Okay. <laughs> so think back uh, almost two years. Vivek Kundra, new federal CIO, what did he do out of the gate? He provided vision. He said, consolidate data centers. And so he said other things too, but consolidate data centers and move to cloud. Basically, I would interpret that as save money and innovate at the same time. Um, and it sort of reminds me of the fact that if you look through history of different countries building uh, factories of different technology levels, you know, they get competitive advantage. Those factories get old. Somebody else builds new factories. They get the competitive advantage. And the people of the old factories are kind of stuck. Well, are we stuck? Uh, you know, Richard here is talking about people with servers that are not backed up. They don't remotely manage them. Uh, they're scared of co-location. And then this innovation thing comes in cloud. It's like, wow, Richard's coming and he's hitting them with, hey, I've got this data center and I want to build you a cloud. Uh, and so the question is, can we save money? Can we innovate at the same time and break out of that cycle of having sort of old factories, if you will? Can our nation become competitive in IT? Um, and the stumbling block that everybody has always stated is security. I'm sure there's other issues. You ask people their concerns. The first number one thing is security. So Richard, to start, to start it off here, how are you going to convince the people with the, the, the old iron to not evolve through successive phases of technological development and just innovate right to cloud? Okay. How can we do that? So here's, here's the story that I've been weaving. There's, there's a couple options. One, one of them is to just do flat infrastructure as a service, nothing. You can do your own OS, you do every, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, that isn't what we've been anticipating because we think that leaves a lot of uh, risk of, available to the, uh, to the whole system. Um, but the, the, the first thing that in, in dealing with the, the really primitive agencies uh, that, that I bumped into is, is to get them to, to do it stepwise. Initially, you know, just this colo and, you know, learn how to remotely manage your stuff, I, which I, I, I assume is relatively straightforward if you really want to do it. And, uh, and get it in a, in, a, in a secure location that's highly available and, and, and just continue operating the status quo. And, that, and then with one of the, the other things that I, I don't want Herndon to become uh, a, a junkyard for antique servers <laughs> is that um, after five years, of life, 
it's either moved to the cloud or it's out. And, and the CIO for this agency was like, that's a great idea. That's finally, got, you know, we'll have a club to you know, beat them into submission with. Um, and with the exception being that, for example, one agency wanted to bring their own cloud out to Herndon. And in which case, well, yeah, you refresh that and keep it going, but uh, they're, they're with an exception basis. So um, it's mostly, uh, and, and then the facility itself will have a SCAP. Uh, we're, we're operating FISMA um, medium now, but we're, since we're just building it out, um, we're going to build it out to the physical requir requirements of FISMA High so that uh, w when we get ready to uh, participate with the GSA and others as, as part of the data center exchange, we'll have, uh, you know, everything set, uh, we'll hopefully with a, a FedRAMP um, certification on the place. Um, so that's really uh, kind of the way I'm tackling the security piece. With the cloud, it's, we, we have about 850 virtual servers right now about 600 terabytes of data that we're going to move to a, a cloud. Uh, we bought the HP uh, cloud suite uh, that we're going to install in Herndon and we're going to start migrating our, our virtual stuff onto that cloud and learn how to use it with ourselves before we start looking to bring in other customers. And, and so is the HP suite that you're using, is that an infrastructure as a service? That'll be infrastructure as a service, but we, our intention is to provide the operating system uh, uh, at, to that level. Okay, which I guess pushes into platform as a service a little bit. Okay, so you're, you're going to give them a choice of pre-configured, secured, government-approved OSs that they can use. Correct. Is that, that's right. Okay. Correct. Uh, so, Carmen, when you uh, consolidated and moved, mm -hmm. um, were there any security revelations that you had, any restrictions that, that, that harmed your ability to effectively and cost-effectively consolidate? Um, there were. Uh, so one of the, a bigger fish than I would have previously anticipated is uh, if you can abstract your business to uh, workflows that maybe are at one FISMA level, that many people participate in this workflow and do that well, uh, you can uh, achieve quite a bit more than if you try to do it by system by system. So we had thought that a whole system would go. It may, in our case, be that a capability is generalized in a cloud that many systems, whether they're co-resident or whether, in fact, they're entirely off-site, can then connect into. So here's an example for us. We have um, some 138 million physical objects in our inventory. Uh, all of those need to be digitized to make them repu repurposable, republishable, available to our constituents. Um, there are tons of systems that manage collected items under management, so collection information systems. So uh, any number of organizations for any number of purposes can take advantage of those systems. But the idea of investing in a stream, a workflow for digitization with approvers and that sort of thing, uh, and hosting that in a cloud way, in an optimized way, in a secure way, uh, is probably a much uh, uh, more bang for the buck, if that's the right way to say it, um, a higher win. And I hadn't known that going in. I would have thought that, you know, we'd look for the low-hanging fruit, move those guys in, look for the next level, build our way up into complexity. But it, it, th that may not be the case for us, and we're admittedly a strange bird. Um, then, uh, perhaps dovetailing with that, there's types of FISMA-level certification that your work will go into, and, and not solely FISMA, but some folks may have PCI requirements around their business processes. So. Um, if you can bucket folks around the FISMA levels, uh, it sounds like that's actually another way to make things a little bit easier, a little bit more cost effective in terms of migrating to a cloud environment. So our, um, our, high, PCI, our high PII items uh, probably will go as one bunch and those applications that are uh, PCI related, credit card related, where we can separate them from the physical location, for us we have stores and restaurants, um, where we can separate those away, it may make sense to move them as a bucket into a cloud. So I, I was surprised at how much more uh, based on workflow it is than on, say, other parameters of system. Yeah, I, I was going to comment that I was interested in the idea of identifying workflows and agency capabilities that aren't necessarily systems. Yep. Did you find that the systems mapped 
easily to a you know one to one to a system to a capability, uh, or were they split, and did that uh, cause any sort of controversy? I, I, it's as if system builders never anticipated that we'd do this. Um, no, so they are they're quite often an amalgam of things, um, and it may require and this is a kind of a rub. It may require some maintenance to the system to cleave things apart. Certainly, if you're going to move a certain capability to be remotely managed. Um, then that's quite problematic if a system is cold and hasn't been maintained, or is fundamentally based on the vendor's product, which doesn't easily move to that model. So if, it, if it's not built to connect to a remote instance and it's not code under your management, you may have to live with it or, or graciously ask the vendor what they can do. Any burning questions out there? So if you don't ask one, I'm going to ask one. Yes, go for it. Yeah, John. Uh, are we uh, envisioning uh, NAS uh, data or non-NAS or admin data versus operations data? Yeah, the, the FAA, the real-time command and control is a separate network than the network I'm responsible for. We do, uh, after 15 minutes, it's deemed to be non-real-time. We do pull off uh, radar, voice, different data like that and put it into the data center. So uh, there's a couple programs that we do that with. The, uh, the discussions, and so, you know, when you look at a cloud with being elastic and, and quickly deployable, on it, I personally don't want the, the NAS, the air traffic control system, being that elastic. You know, I like it really steady and stable. But there's a lot of activities like development test, data storage, uh, maintenance logs, you know, all those kinds of things that are not, a, they're, they're, they're in support of the, the, the air traffic system but they can come off and, and reside in, the, in, the, in, a, in a cloud or in a data center environment. What about monitoring? Do you, do you have plans to bring any monitoring? Um, we work closely with the monitoring, or like the, the MDT, so they're, the desk, they're little laptop computers that they go out and preset and, and measure and monitor and adjust the NAS equipment. Those are on our network now. Um, the, it, it, that's, a, that's a real challenge, and, you know, and it gets, you know, the, and it, Classified is much easier because that's a sharp line where between the, uh, the operation of the airspace and, and the data center is, is a fuzzier line. But my personal feeling is if you're not, move, if you're not controlling the separation of aircraft, you know, it, it, there's no reason why it can't reside in the data center. So, Richard, I thought it was really interesting that you mentioned that for a certain kind of data, you don't want the full cloud elasticity. Yes. Which raises the question with Carmen and Richard, how cloudy do you want to be? I mean, do you want to give your program offices on-demand interfaces where they can grab computing resources on their own without coming to the IT shop? Or do you have some sort of middle approach that you're looking towards? Uh, ideally, um, we would separate compute from storage and, and enjoy them being elastic in, in different terms, but uh, I, I do think we'll want both, and I do think that we'll um, uh, have customers that want a, a very cloudy world. Uh, for us, the, the problem is ensuring that the data, of, uh, the, the archival copy of the data resides in, in potentially a non-cloud environment. Uh, so, for example, we have uh, scientists that do a lot of DNA processing. It may come to pass that they can do their DNA processing in the cloud. Um, and that could help, or they, there's astronomers that, that need to process stuff. It could be that the burstable CPU helps them a great deal in speeding up their calculations. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, the problem, one of the problems that we've seen for uh, burstable storage uh, is we have some domains in, th that expand uh, the amount of storage that they need, but then they identify the long-term artifacts versus the interim work artifacts, the work products in the middle. Uh, of all the work they do, only some of it is worth saving for long-term, uh, and where I work, that's a very good discipline to cultivate because uh, we're very voracious consumers of storage. Um, but the idea that they would uh, conscientiously migrate those into a preferred environment is very high risk for us. So while we're interested in virtual storage, we don't know if we can police folks sufficiently well and for the institution to lose data because at some point it was left out in a wrong cloud storage place would be particularly problematic. So it, it's a high risk item for us. 
Yeah, for, for us, um, we definitely, we, we've got like, I think 15,000 uh, engineers and technicians that support the NAS. So uh, we are a very technical organization and, and to have, uh, some of them are, you know, official developers and some of them kind of, I think, what, is it, there's a class three, is that the term we were using the other day that uh, people bootleg in the applications? Um, we have a lot of that going on too. And it seems in the FAA, and maybe your organizations as well, but every time somebody has a good idea, they need a server. And there's like 1,500 servers that aren't in the data center up at the tech center that are, represent a huge investment in initial purchase and then ongoing O&M uh, that we would like to get that. In fact, that was one of the primary business case uh, issues in, in going to the Hearn Center in the cloud is that if a developer, uh, an experimenter, a tester, can go online, provision himself a server, you know, and then five minutes later be up and running and do it, and then when he's done with it in three days, three months, you know, six months, and walk away from it, uh, or even if he needed it year after year, the, the unit cost uh, for a server in the cloud is significantly lower than going out and buying one would, of your own. I would agree. That's kind yeah. of the most seductive thing in terms of uh, the folks that will be, that are our customers, is they want quick provisioning, uh, they, they make the wrong assumption that if it's provisioned at a cloud provider that somehow it's magically outside the cloak of our oversight. So we have to help them, help disabuse them of that idea. Um, but quick provisioning is, is really what they're into and they'll consume that as, as much as we can make it available to them. Yeah, yeah so it sounds like you're, you're wanting to be quite cloudy. Uh, Carmen mentioned taking storage off the cloud and into some more traditional uh, areas to sort of improve longevity, security, comfort level. Um, so how far are you willing to take cloudiness? That's my question for you. I mean, the, when you talk to real cloud people, they want all clouds to be interoperable so that jobs can be moved between clouds. Do you have any interest in and tension in adopting an interface that might uh, be similar or the same as an industry interface so that people could move jobs from your cloud to some commercial cloud and back again? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, one of the guys at DOE is working uh, that issue, um, and we've been talking with him. And, you know, it, and when he got done briefing me on the technology, it was like, uh, you know, it would be a huge game changer for the way F the uh, government does IT. Um, and the answer is, yeah, if, he, if, if we can do that. Uh, and DOE's that got done some amazing research on, in that area to, to make a, a, a data center as a commodity. Now we've now you've really done something. Now we can get the unit costs way down. So yeah, we'd be really interested. I'm doing this just because I'm a cheap guy, and I don't like spending a lot of money for stuff that I don't need to spend a lot of money on. And uh, the the more I can squeeze my cost, and I don't care how I do it, and if and if I don't need a data center staff because someone else does it better than me, I'm. I'm going to do that. I, I would agree. I'd say that uh, we have, uh, with the advent of social networking, we have a lot of folks that have really pushed the envelope with how much they're willing to collaborate with each other, whether it's sharing data, commenting on data, sharing in compilation processes. It's almost as if, uh, you know, these collaborators uh, want, it, it usually hits a point in their projects where they have to make the decision, okay, whose infrastructure or whose cloud can we select for this? If they had uh, more choices uh, in a fantasy maybe to, to decompose the problem uh, in partitions and then unify it later on or at least know that it'll integrate later on, I think that'd be, that would really uh, vastly improve the speed of science. So Richard, you, you mentioned you were moving to cloud because you're a cheap guy. <laughs> I hope some, hopefully some reporter will quote you on that. <laughs> uh, Carmen, what's the driver for you moving to cloud? Um, for us, it's probably to uh, leapfrog in getting access to technologies that we wouldn't be able to uh, get on our own or, or, or invest on in our own. Uh, so if we went to a cloud provider, we'd love to get a CDN, say. Uh, for uh, facilitated publishing. If we, um, if we went into uh, certain arrangements with uh, networks of existing universities, that would help our research 
uh, get completed and then also help foster, again, our mission of getting our research objects into the hands of researchers. So um, it, there are certain clouds that, that <coughs> seem to be a, a coalition or federation based and those have uh, a great deal of appeal. Okay. You've had a chance to think up some of your questions. So I'll take an audience question or two, and then we're going to move into a security focus. And uh, so if you want to take the first punch on security, you go right ahead. I'm going to call names if I have to. <laughs> yeah, let me ask one of the, uh, one of the uh, federal, the smaller federal agencies uh, or a smaller subset, is that if your boss told you you had to go to a cloud, tomorrow, what would you say? Good. God bless you. <laughs> Somebody else? Ah. Oh, no questions? Okay. Okay, well, I'll, I'll ask a question then. Actually, no, I said I'd say names. I'm going to follow up on my promise. Mark, ask a question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> question. <laughs> I did, I did. Okay, security. Oh, go for it, please. Okay. Why is the FAA giving you the assistance and it's not, like, say, a GSA or a board? If it is inherently a GSA service, do you, do you plan on transitioning that? If, right now, because of the, the, the low cost of, that we, we're significantly lower than anybody else cost-wise because of the Hernan facility lease is so low. Um, and I was given a five-year span on this thing. Normally you get a real estate lease for, you know, 20 years, but they said five years with an option. But after, in, at, after three or four years, uh, the investment analysis group is going to come back and look and see if we still offer competitive advantage. If, if we're, our unit costs are still, you know, like a tenth the cost of Terramark. Uh, I, though I have a feeling the industry is going to, costs are going to plummet here shortly as well. Um, if, if we are not offering you know, a competitive advantage uh, or a, a, a dollar savings, and no, we'll shut it down and we'll go somewhere else. Yeah, there's no question that we're only doing it because we can't find it cheaper anywhere else. And we're good at this stuff. I mean, this is not something that's a stretch for us. And that, I guess that, that discussion really points to the need for adoption of interfaces that work among multiple clouds. <clears throat> I mean, if we can achieve that, <clears throat> then they really could shut down their data center at some point and migrate all the jobs to some other cloud, and it would all be fine, except you'd be stuck with a data center and some hardware you need to get rid of, but uh, it could be done. Yep. Um, another question. Nope, oh good, I get to ask it. Security. So, I guess, Rachel, I'll pick on you. You mentioned an actual product. You mentioned HP is going to give you a, a, a cloud suite. What kind of security have they promised you? Everything. The, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm not, my, my data center guys are the technical guys that, that made the, the product selection. And we competed against all the, the big vendors, and it was best value, and it wasn't, uh, it, it was done against a pre-competed contract. So if you're a vendor here, you didn't see it announced. It was just done off of our pre-competed agency contract. Um, the, you know, everyone says they do it, um, you know, perfectly. And, and yet you talk to the Gartner guys and nobody does it completely and perfectly. So uh, I, I've, I've had some fascinating discussions here with some of the vendors uh, that, hope, that might plug some of the holes that we're gonna find. But the, the bottom line is the, it's a fully integrated suite. I'm not doing any system integration work. Uh, it's something they claim they've done for others, uh, for the Terramarks and the Amazons. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I'm just gonna play it. Uh, my, my, my security guys and my data center guys are giving me a thumbs up. I have a feeling what we're going to find as we start this up, deploy it, and play with it, we're going to find those holes. But right now, the simple thing I want to do is I want to have someone be able to go online, provision a server, and storage, you know, a network, mm -hmm. and then give it to them. Now, I think the real challenge comes when you start doing things that are more sophisticated than that. Um, so within that, that first realm of sophistication, uh, you're going to need to provide them some sort of secured OS image. And ha yes. have, you, have you done that? And has that broken any of the customer applications? We're right now, and, and this is the beauty of what I've got, is just strictly infrastructure. Um, the app piece is what, where the really hard work is. 
Um, we've got 840 or so virtual machines, and that's going to be our first target audience right now. The, the legacy is the hard part. For someone new coming in who wants to provision a server from scratch, you know, they'll get our, you know, standard secure patched and all the security stuff built into it, and they'll build from there. Um, and, and so, again, I think ignorance is bliss on my part. The nuts and bolts that my data center guys get to deal with is, is another problem, but I think uh, I'm not looking to see any major sh stuff on that. Mm -hmm. So, Carmen. So on the security note, a lot of federal security officers in particular are hesitant to move to cloud uh, because they, to put it lightly, they don't have the warm and fuzzy, that things are secure. So if you have the warm and fuzzy, how did you get it? <laughs> we, um, uh, I can say a couple of things there. Um, you're, you're familiar with the FedRAMP uh, work that's been going on and, and kind of a a significant impediment of that is um, will one uh, auditor from one agency accept the review that's done, a CNA that's done by someone else? Um, we believe that that, that that will come to a head and be sort of forcibly tried or, or I believe the only way that that will be, that will come to fruition is, is that yes, someone will be forced to do it if that changes the way that a CNA ends up getting conducted or it, or it mandates, uh, you know, enumeration of high, medium, and low levels, you know, across the vendor community, that would actually be good mm -hmm. for, for the space, for all the vendors mm -hmm. that are competing in that space. Um, so I, I'm hopeful there. Um, I s recently spent some time with uh, Casey Coleman's group at, at GSA. You know, GSA has um, moved their email. Uh, and I think by moving some of these uh, more commodity services um, uh, to the cloud and living to tell about it, I'm sure there's going to be some, you know, some bad thing that gets found or some incidents that, uh, that happen. Um, every other computing thing had some incidents that happened, you know, so, so there'll be something that gets found. But the, that's a, a great litmus test for what can be done for um, that particular application. And I think once we get email asked and answered and a few other ones asked and answered, um, then we'll be able to talk about uh, uh, comparing vendors in a generalized space. Um, and that, that feels like it's only two or three years off. So I'm, I'm bullish on the space. I, you know, that's the warm and fuzzy, I'd say. And yeah. then, you know, the offers for um, costs of establishing a private cloud are are compelling, you know, so, so the storage vendors want to move into that space and they're working the appropriate issues, you know, we can ask whether the speed of the cost, you know, the speed that they're addressing the issues or the cost that we'll incur when we actually deploy them are, you know, to our liking, but uh, luckily I should say that the Smithsonian benefits from the patriotic largesse of many of our vendors. Um, uh, you know, so that actually helps. Yes. Um, and then lastly, I think that there's just been such an, uh, an industry-wide raising of consciousness that that's a very, very good thing as well. So Carmen mentioned FedRAMP. Who here has heard of FedRAMP? About half of you. So FedRAMP is a government-wide initiative under the federal CIO. And in my own words, it's to get the government to act as a single customer in evaluating the security of large public cloud providers. Uh, why, is this, why is it important? Why does it, in my opinion, actually have to succeed in one form or another? Uh, and the answer is that every agency, every bureau within an agency, wants to evaluate cloud security according to their own policies. And government agency policies don't always even agree with each other which means that if you take a cloud provider that's resource pooled, it is not possible for them to instantiate all agency policies on that one cloud. And by the way, they have a lot of other customers. So that's what FedRAMP is about, getting the, getting the government to act as a single customer with respect to that security evaluation. And, and what's interesting to me is just a few weeks ago, the new federal CIO, you know, Vivek Kundra initiated it. The new federal CIO came to NIST and announced 
that, and I'm not quoting him, um, that eventually he plans on making it mandatory. So that kind of goes to, you know, Carmen's point of, oh, I'm hoping FedRAMP will sort of get some teeth, uh, you know, provide the benefit that it uh, is proposed to, go to provide. And that, yes, indeed, will give more warm and fuzzies to the security officers when, you know, when, when and if that happens. You also mentioned email. So Smithsonian, um, among, if you rank all the agencies in order of security sensitivity, I certainly wouldn't put the Smithsonian towards the top. Uh, and so if anybody can move to email besides GSA, I'm hoping it would be you. What are your plans in that area? <laughs> there you go. That get me in trouble. The tapes are still rolling, right? Um, so we only want to be number one in your heart, that's all. Uh, so, um, uh, so some, uh, some very good colleagues um, that I get to spend quality time with um, are evaluating the privacy and legal concerns that we have. Um, and um, uh, we, uh, I'll, I'll struggle for the words, but we stumbled in the natural places to stumble, right? So uh, based on the fact that a lot of us have an eagle in the corner of our checks, sort of uh, we talked about we want a continental US based cloud capability in which to comport our email in uh, and certain vendors could offer it and certain vendors couldn't and so we asked the logical questions and then our procurement folks said well we want to feel comfortable eliminating certain folks from any potential procurement. Uh, we said uh, you know we want to make sure a lot of um, citizen-based email services seem to allow the vendor to inspect the contents of the email and do things like provide related ads. That's probably not good for the people's business to be inspected in a way that we don't understand, so we can't do that. So we went down this whole punch list, and having spent some time with Team GSA, they went through the whole punch list too, and they, the, the, the right things happened there. The switches are all in the right place or whatever. So. Um, that's actually, a, uh, I'm feeling particularly comfortable from a technology standpoint. Um, one of the hurdles now that I think uh, we'll have to live through is, uh, and someone mentioned it in, in an earlier session about uh, uh, e-discovery. And so e-discovery policies, I, I think, and, and I think Google, who G GSA selected, has an answer for e-discovery. It will be good, and God bless the people at GSA for this, you know, it'll be good a year from now uh, when all of us can talk to GSA about what that year was like to live through in terms of e-discoveries. Did it work well? That sort of thing. Um, so I think the dominoes are falling, but we're not quite ready to commit yet. And then lastly, I would say we do have um, s sunk costs in our email, so that's just work, you know, just work or whatever to get the, the effort done. Okay, any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering about uh, how big a challenge is, challenge is it for you as a service provider to keep me satisfied as your customer that the security is still in place, that it's just protecting it over a period of time, providing it with support, allowing mm -hmm. you in. Uh, how big a deal is that for, uh, for you as a service provider? I I, I'm, a, I'm an old process guy from, uh, you know, quality assurance. Yeah, I, so continuous monitoring is probably the, the best answer. And then making reports available both real time and, you know, uh, scheduled uh, to you guys to, to let you know that we have done what we said we were going to do. That's, that's the only way. It's, uh, it, and, and likewise, in, in our environment, the cost will be shared and that if you're a participant in our data center, you'll be on the group that's going to set the cost. So you'll see where all the money's going, you'll see what, you know, it, it's, it's, it's got to be open. If you try and play hide the button games, you, you, all is lost. So, and A lot of the vendors uh, that we have worked with uh, for hosting already provide some format of uh, dashboarded KPIs that you can you know, drill in at various levels. And, and maybe that could standardize across vendors. That would be great. One of the things that, we, we, that came, at a session like this uh, with a lot of financial institutions at it, um, you mentioned, you know, I mentioned to them that uh, would you want to know who got into a certain file and how much did they take out 
And uh, one of the vendors here, I forget which one it was, had that kind of stuff that there's normal behavior and then there's abnormal behavior and their system takes that into account. So those are the kind of things that if I were a system owner at somebody else's cloud, I'd want to know that they had that capability. So. Okay, any more questions? Yes, please. That, that's, a, that's a good policy question. I'll kind of look to Peter on that one, but my, from, from a, a, an infrastructure as a service or a low-level platform as a service provider, that's their responsibility. To, I mean, they, they have supposedly have a certified system, and, and that system, the expectation is that it would be used in the way that it was certified to be used. Um, uh, and as, as, a, as a customer of Richard's Cloud, I wouldn't use it unless I was sure that the other customers couldn't affect me. So I would assume the other customers are malicious, not just stupid, but malicious. And if his security controls are good enough that I still have the warm and fuzzy that, that we hope we're all going to have if we're going to adopt cloud, uh, then I'd go ahead and use the service. If I didn't think that the security controls were high enough that I could be assured that some malicious other customer couldn't get to me, then the level of data sensitivity that I'd use that cloud for would be very, very low. Not that I wouldn't use it, just, you know, you, you put, you, you put, you take data, you categorize its sensitivity, you put it in the most cost-effective location that meets the, its security needs. Um, but for, for most data, uh, and for most clouds, I really encourage people to assume the other customers are malicious, and rely on that cloud security architecture to protect you and, and, and demand that it, that it does so. Okay, so uh, let me see if this answers the question then. For example, if Treasury was one of the people that shared that cloud with us, my expectation is that, that, that we'd VLAN in their, it would be on their network and it wouldn't use our internet access point. Okay, we are out of time, but I'd like to ask uh, the panelists to take just 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and just if you can communicate one point that you want them to remember, because remember, people only remember like 10% of what we say. <laughs> if there's one point they can remember, uh, give it to us. Carmen, you're first. <laughs> uh, uh, I would say that the, both the effort to consolidate and the lifestyle in a cloud environment will find uh, your existing challenge, pain points, that sort of things. They won't, by and large, go away. So if you have weaknesses in documentation, we have an embryonic chargeback model. That, that's problematic in this world. Um, if you have those sorts of uh, naivetes or, or, or dysfunctional workflows in your environment, those will only be exacerbated by this faster moving world. Mm. And uh, from my perspective, consolidation from, you know, from desktop networks, call centers to the cloud, you've got to um, have top level management support and you need to move fast. If, if you study it too long, it ain't going to happen, no matter what it is. There's always, there, IT people, there's a million ways that something ain't going to work and there's a million ways that you can make it work. You just got to, you got to hit it while they're in a good mood, I think. Well, or shocked, one or the other. 
Richard, Carmen, uh, let me join the audience in thanking you. So it was, thank you. it was fun. And Peter, thank you very much as well. Um, this concludes the uh, sessions uh, for uh, after lunch. Uh, we now have a few minutes break uh, before we start our next round of boardroom meetings upstairs.